First Kings chapter 17, First Kings chapter 18, and First Kings chapter 19 are very powerful chapters in the Word of God. In chapter number 17, we find it's the chapter provision. Chapter 18 is the chapter of proving. And chapter 19 is the chapter of pity. And sometimes, my dear friends, uh, we live in that state of provision where God's just a blessing and providing. Then some days we live in that day of proving when God proves that he's God in our lives. But too often we find ourselves in that state of pity where we're walking on our lower lip, forgetting how good God has really been in our lives. 1 Kings chapter number 17, we'll begin reading in verse number 18, or verse number 8, I'm sorry. The Bible says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose, and he went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks, and he called to her, and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel, that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her, and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. Uh, and she said, As the Lord uh, thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in, in a cruise. Uh, and behold, I'm gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, uh, unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. Isn't that like a preacher wanting it first? Hmm? Uh, Make me a little cake first, and you go on, huh? That's what a lot of people have a perception of a preacher. But what the man of God was doing here was trying to prove her faith. Mm, he's teaching her that if you put God first and the things of God first, uh, you'll never want for anything. Let's read on in verse number 14. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. Let's pray. Father, we bless your holy name. We thank you for your goodness and your tender mercy. Thank you for this day that we celebrate. Lord, you alone could have only done this these 24 years. And God, we bless you. Lord, we know we haven't always been what we should be, but Lord, we're thankful you've always been everything that you said you would be and so much more. Now, Father, I pray for the next few minutes you to rest our attention. I pray that you'd put a hedge about us. I pray for the sweet Holy Ghost of God to not be grieved or quenched. Uh, and I pray that you'd be magnified and you'd be glorified in and throughout the service. Uh, I do pray if there be any amongst us today unsaved, lost without the Lord, uh, that today would be the day that they come to the end of themselves and realize their lost condition. And I pray that they'd come and give their heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I pray for your people, Lord. No telling what they have faced these days. Uh, no telling the perils. No telling the pitfalls. Uh, no telling, Lord, the pressure that's been on their life. Uh, and God, I pray today would not only be a day of relief and release, but I pray today would be a day of revival in their heart and soul. Uh, God, I pray that you would use this unworthy vessel, uh, and God, you would glorify your namesake. Now be with Sister Mary, touch her this morning. Uh, be with Sister Carol, be with others that are sick. Uh, God, be with those that are uh, providentially hindered. But for these that are here, uh, God, move accordingly and have your will and way amongst us. Uh, Father, we'll not fail to bow these unworthy heads and thank you for all that you've done. Uh, have your will and way now. We'll bless you for it. For it's in the wonderful and glorious name of the Lord Jesus we ask these things. Uh, amen and amen. In this chapter, we find three miracles. In verses 3 through 6, you find the miracle of the brook. In verses uh, uh, 12 through 16, you find the miracle of the barrel. 
And then we find uh, uh, in verses 19 through 23, you find a miracle on the bed. When her son dies, uh, and Elijah raises him from the dead. Uh, uh, but I want you to notice some things that we read here uh, and get some context of what's going on in this chapter, uh, and we'll get to the thought. Uh, the first thing I want you to notice is the famine. Look in verse number 1. Uh, said Elijah the Tishbite, uh, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord uh, God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew uh, nor rain these years, but according to my word. Uh, look at verse number 7. Uh, and it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. Uh, uh, can I say that uh, according to Scripture, it did not rain for some three and a half years. Uh, friends, it did not only not rain, there was no dew, there was no moisture. Uh, it was arid and it was dry. Uh, can I say there's a famine in our land today? Uh, there's not a famine for the preaching of the Word of God, uh, but there's a famine for the hearing of the Word of God. Uh, can I say this day and age that we live in, we have more access uh, to more preaching and more Bible teaching and more of the Word of God uh, than any generation before us. Uh, but uh, since uh, uh, the Lord Jesus ascended back upon high, uh, now you'll be hard pressed to find any more of a wicked and perverse generation than what we live in today uh, because people just aren't interested in what God has to say even in our Baptist churches we see the famine I want you to notice uh, the frail look at verse number 10 so she arose, went, uh, so he arose, went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called unto her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water and vessel that I may drink. We, we find here there is a widow woman who is frail. Amen. She is weak. She, by her own testimony, says she has but a little meal and a little oil. She hasn't eaten much in a long time. She's withered away. I can see her in my mind just down to sticks and bones herself. She's just a skeleton with skin on it. She's frail and she's weak. Can I say you may have came into the house of God this morning. You may have come in weak. Weak spiritually. It was all you could do to put one more foot in front of another. You have faced life's pressures. You have faced this old world. You have faced uh, that sorry, no good devil. You have faced uh, even your flesh, which has been an enemy against you uh, and the Spirit of God living within you. Uh, uh, friend, uh, uh, you may try to read your Bible, but yet it seems like you don't get anything from it. Uh, you may try to pray, but it seems like it doesn't get answered. Uh, just seems like everything is falling apart, uh, and you've come in today as long low as you've ever been. This lady's weak. She's frail. There's a famine. I want you to notice she's prepared to eat her final meal. Look at verse number 12. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil on a cruise. And behold, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Hmm. Listen. That's a sobering thought, thinking I'm going to make one more meal and then I'm going to die. Yeah. Amen. Hmm? I dare say none of us have ever had that experience. Amen. She's looked in the cupboard. She's looked in the meal barrel. She's looked at the cruise of oil. She's looked at her possibility of getting anything else. And she's come to one conclusion. I've got just a little to sustain me and my son. We're going to eat this and die. This is her final meal. I wonder if this was our final church service. Would you be ready to meet Jesus? Can I say, one day there will be a last church service and the Lord's going to take his church home. This could be that service. Right. But I'm looking around at what's going on in this country. That it may come to a point where it may be illegal for us to assemble like this. Right. Yeah. Amen. 
You say, that'll never happen. You obviously do not look around the world very much. It's happening all over the globe, and they're pushing for it to happen in America. I've said for years, and you've ignored me, that the fundamental Christian is the most uh, 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 discriminated against in this world. You can stand up and you can praise Satan, you can praise every other religion, you can worship the Pope, you can do whatever you want to, uh, and nobody blinks an eye at it. Uh, but if you stand up and say, I'm going to live by the Bible, believe the Bible, and you preach the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, you're a bigot, you're insensitive, you're narrow-minded, uh, uh, and you need to be done away with because you are not with the program. Right, right. I do not be to be a doomsday kind of person, but they are building concentration camps all over America. They're not building concentration camps for Biden lovers. You're welcome. That didn't cost you anything. Amen. They're building them for people who will not comply. Now, personally, they're building them for after the church is taken out of here and every redneck is not going to give up their gun and not going to take the market beads, they're going to end up in a concentration camp. Yeah. Yeah. But they might just start practicing before the rapture. Amen. COVID was a test run of how they could control people. Right. Right. Now that it's all coming out that all the, the fallacies behind it all, they've got to come up with something else. I'm just saying... In the scriptures, this was this lady in her mind. This was her final meal. What if this was the last time we get to dine at the master's table? Then I want you to notice the fatal fate. She said in verse number 12 that she may dress the cake for me and my son that we may eat it and die. It's one thing to know that you have something and you're going to die at some point. Let me let you in on a little secret. Unless the Lord comes, we're all going to die. But to have it so real and so prevalent that she knows she's going to die, but not only her, her son. You that are a parent here today, you will shelter your child from any danger that you can, even if it means you giving your life for your child. Amen. One of the most difficult things to fathom, because it goes against our thinking and it goes against nature, that a parent should bury a child. We always think we're going to get to a point where we get old, we die, and our children will bury us. This woman is looking at her son. Uh, uh, she has no husband. She has no means. She has no way to take care of her son anymore. She's given all that she's got. Uh, her son is weak like she is. He's frail. Uh, she knows that this is it. Uh, and that revelation over this woman must be tearing her apart uh, when she knows not only is she going to die, but she's going to watch her son die. Friend, look at our young people. If we don't get something from God, not only are we going to die spiritually, they're going to die. We've got to do everything we can to protect the young people of our church. We ought to do without that they may have. I'm interested today where she says in verse number 12, and I remember back in camp meeting, Brother William Jackson kind of hit on this a little bit, was he was running around here like Daffy Duck having himself a spell. But I gleaned a thought. Now I'm interested in verse number 12 where she says, Behold, I'm gathering two sticks. Now I want to preach with God's help for a few minutes this morning on gathering sticks. First time I preached this message was in revival meeting in Georgia. This past week, 
Well, Stacy said, how'd that go when you preached that at your church? I said, I hadn't preached that at our church. He said, what? You didn't preach that at your church? I said, no. Second time I preached this message was in Grand Cayman, Calvary Baptist Church. Then I felt led to kick off revival in Quincy, Florida with this message. But I never had any burden to preach it here. Until I was sitting down in Florida this week and God said, they need to gather some sticks. Can I say this morning that gathering sticks takes fortitude. The widow is frail. The widow is weak. The widow knows she's going to die. She knows her son's going to die. Yeah, uh, if she was like us, uh, she'd just throw up her hand and say, okay, let us sit here until we die. Yeah, but no, she had something within her uh, that wouldn't let her sit there and die, Brother Ray. She had some fortitude. Uh, she said, as long as I've got strength in my body, uh, I'm going to do all that I can do. Uh, uh, she had some fortitude. Uh, to get up uh, and to go out uh, and to gather some sticks. Uh, look, uh, there's a famine in the land. Uh, hey, uh, folks may be frail. This might even be our final meal. Uh, but let's not just sit here and die. Uh, somebody get up and go gather some sticks. Uh, hey, we do have a little meal. Uh, we do have a little oil. Uh, oh, we need some sticks. Uh, hey, it takes fortitude uh, when it looks like desperation and death all around you uh, but I'm going to trust the Lord and do what I can do and he'll do for me what I can't do for myself uh, I can gather some sticks uh, I may not be able to cut down some trees uh, I may not be able to get any more meal uh, but I can gather some sticks it takes some fortitude uh, thank God for folks that had fortitude if it wasn't for fortitude we wouldn't have a church today yeah uh, there's many that died being burned at a stake. There's many that's been beheaded. There's many that watched their children be beheaded before them. Uh, but they just kept gathering sticks. Uh, and because of that, there was the perpetuity of the church. Uh, hey, it just kept waiting on. Uh, and God kept blessing. Uh, God kept saving. Uh, God kept planting churches. Uh, and because of that, we're here today because somebody had enough fortitude to gather some sticks. Uh, can I say, this widow pressed on through her pain. Again, she's nothing but skin and bones. She's got to be hurting. Her joints are hurting. Her tongue is cleaving to the root of her mouth. Uh, she's not got much to more time. Uh, She's in physical pain, but even though she's in physical pain, she presses through to gather some sticks. Amen. Some of you are hurting here today. Might not be physical pain, might be mental pain, mental anguish. Might have a broken heart. Just keep gathering sticks. She pressed through her pain she pressed through her plight can I say physical pain is one thing but that internal pain is a whole different subject she's hurting looking at her son knowing her son's going to die knowing the plight that has befallen her uh, she could have just thrown in the town and gave up uh, but she has enough fortitude saying this doesn't only affect me uh, it affects my son uh, and friend uh, no man liveth unto himself and no man dieth unto himself there is somebody else that you are impacting uh, so keep gathering sticks uh, regardless of the plight or the lot that has been Fallen you. Amen. Can I say this woman, it wasn't easy. Can I say my dad instilled in me nothing worth having comes easy. Mm. There's one indictment against this uh, mm, controller age game playing generation we got today. They don't have any work ethic. Amen. They want everything to come easy. Young couples start out wanting everything mom and dad worked 30 years to get. Right. Mm. Doesn't come easy. Amen. Work is a four-letter word. Yeah. But work will 
impact you and change you. We got young people today that don't want to work. Well, then they shouldn't eat. They get hungry enough, they'll work. Mm. I know you don't like that kind of preaching. But even though her plight, her hunger, and her hurting for her son, she still gathered some sticks. Can I say this widow pressed on through her prostration? She, had, she was hopeless. She had no more hope through her hopelessness. Uh, she realized she was going to die. She realized her son was going to die. Nothing was going to change that. Uh, but she still pressed on and gathered some sticks. Amen. Hey, Brother Doug, I just don't have any hope in this situation. Just gather sticks. Now see, we have the benefit of seeing the end of the story. Her gathering sticks changed her whole situation. You sitting there saying there is no hope will not help you. Just keep gathering sticks. That may change your whole situation. Uh, everything she thought was going to happen didn't happen. Uh, and it all started with her just having the fortitude to gather some sticks. Can I say this? She's not wallowing in self-pity. She's gathering sticks. She's not over there sucking her thumb. Woe is me. God hates me. She's doing what she can. She's gathering sticks. Gathering sticks takes fortitude. Can I say this? Gathering sticks takes faith. The Bible says in Exodus 15, verse 23, And when they came to Mar, they could not drink the waters of Mar, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mar. And the people murmured against Moses. It's always got man of God's fault when everything goes bad. You know that. Uh, they're saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the uh, Lord showed him a tree, which he'd cast into the waters, and the waters were made sweet. Uh, and there made him for them a statue, an ordinance, and he proved them. Say, what happened? He found a stick, a tree. And he put it in the bitter water, and they became sweet. Can I say, sometimes we just got to have faith. It made no sense to Moses that if he took that tree and threw it in the waters, the water would be made sweet. I'm thinking the tree's probably got bark on it. It's nasty. I'm thinking the tree may have roots that have mud on them. That's nasty. Hey, the tree may have a, a critters living inside it or bugs living inside of it. It's nasty. It makes no sense taking a nasty tree, throwing it in bitter waters, and you're going to have nasty bitter waters. That's what makes sense. But God said to do it, and Moses just did it. He took that nasty tree with all that nastiness and threw it in them bitter waters uh, and the people drank of it and it was sweet. Uh, hey, and what happened? Go study it out. Again, God leads them to an oasis where there's a lot of sweet water. Uh, why? Because he had faith. Uh, listen, uh, I just have faith. Just gather sticks. Uh, that's all I can tell you. Uh, hey, just trust the Lord. Uh, hey, let everything else go to pieces but keep your trust in the Lord. Uh, his name is faithful and true. He's never failed you. He's never failed me. Uh, I don't know much, but I'm going to keep doing what he said to do. Uh, I'm just going to believe God. Uh, hey, the disciples said, Sirs, uh, we believe God. Uh, would you believe God today? Just gather some sticks. Uh, takes fortitude. Takes fire. Our faith, and it takes fire. It takes a zeal. Hmm. Can I say, the Bible says in Proverbs 26, 20, where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. The Bible says in Ezekiel 24, 10, heap on wood, kindle the fire, consume the flesh, and spice it well, and let the bones be burned. What, what do you say? You can't have fire without wood, so you've got to gather sticks to keep the fire burning. But it takes fire to get up and get out and gather sticks. Say, preacher, I don't know if I have enough fire. Well, Jeremiah threw in the towel. He said he didn't have anything either, but there was a fire shut up in his bones, uh, uh, and he could not stay. Uh, listen, you may think your fire's gone. You may think there is no hope, uh, but if you belong to the Lord and the Holy Ghost lives inside of you, uh, he knows how to kindle enough uh, to get you up uh, and get you moving. Uh, and when you start gathering sticks, uh, that fire gets greater and greater and greater. Uh, and before before long, you're a blaze for Jesus, my dear friends. Uh, it takes fire to gather sticks. It takes faith. It takes fortitude. Can I say this? It takes foresight to gather sticks. Our whole problem is 
We as Christians have buried our head in the sand. We have no foresight. Uh, here's the average viewpoint of a Christian. All we can see is us and our situations and our problems. Listen, I don't care how bad your situation is, and it may be bad. I don't care how big of your problems they are, and they may be big. I don't care how much pain you're in, and, you, and pain hurts. If you're saved, you're a winner. You don't have to look very far to see folks that aren't saved. And they're on their way to hell. But Christians have no foresight. We gimp into church week after week and don't even pay attention to what's going on. We need to gather sticks. We need to have some foresight. Friend, I don't know how much time we got. We need to gather some sticks. We all know people aren't ready to meet the Lord. We need to gather some sticks. Because our country is in dire, dire, dire shape. We're at a crossroads. If you can't see what has happened in our, in our country in the last few years, can I say this? It just didn't happen. There has been a plan to overthrow America for hundreds of years, uh, but they've actually pulled it off, and they've been st they started it when Obama was in office, uh, and they are strategically striving to overthrow America and make America not what America's always been. Most of them people protesting yesterday probably aren't even citizens. Well, I found something else this morning when I went to get that poem out. I think I'll just read it. it might make you mad. Don't care. It says, I, for one, am quite disturbed by actions of so-called American citizens. And I'm tired of this nation worrying about whether or not we are offending some individual or their culture. Since the terrorist attacks on September 11th, we have experienced a surge in patriotism by the majority of Americans. However, the dust from the attacks had barely settled in New York and Washington, D.C. when the politically correct crowd began complaining about the possibility that our patriotism was offending others. I am not against immigration, nor do I hold a grudge against anyone who is seeking a better life by coming to America. In fact, our country's population is almost entirely comprised of descendants of immigrants. However, there are a few things that those who have recently come to our country need to understand. First of all, it is not our responsibility to continually try not to offend you in any way. The idea of America being a multicultural community has served only to dilute our sovereignty and our nation's identity. As Americans, we have our own culture, our own society, our own language, and our own lifestyle. This culture, called the American way, has been de developed over centuries of struggles, trials, and victories by millions of men and women who have sought freedom. Our forefathers fought, bled, and died at places such as Bunker Hill, San Juan, Iwo Jima, Normandy, Korea, Vietnam. We speak English, not Spanish, Arabic, Chinese, Japanese, Russian, or any other language. Uh, therefore, if you wish to become part of our society, learn our language. Uh, in God we trust is our national motto. This is not some off-the-wall Christian right-wing political slogan. It is our national motto. It is engraved in stone in the House of Representatives in, in our capital, uh, and it is printed on our currency. Uh, we adopted this motto because Christian men and women on Christian principles founded this nation, uh, and this is clearly documented throughout our history. If it is appropriate for our motto to be inscribed in the halls of our highest level of government, then it is certainly appropriate to display it on the walls of our schools. Uh, God is in our pledge, our national anthem, nearly every patriotic song, uh, and in our founding documents. Uh, we honor his birth, death, and resurrection as holidays, uh, and we turn to him in prayer in times of crisis. Uh, if God offends you, uh, then I suggest you consider another part of the world as your new home, uh, because God is a part of our culture, and we are proud to have him. Uh, we are proud of our heritage and those who have honorably defended our freedoms. 
items. Uh, we celebrate Independence Day, Memorial Day, Veterans Day, and Flag Day. Uh, we have parades, picnics, and barbecues. Uh, and we are proud. And we have proud. We and we proudly wave our flag. Uh, as an American, I have the right to wave my flag, swing, sing the national anthem, uh, quote my national motto, and cite my pledge whenever and wherever I choose. Uh, if the stars and stripes offend you, uh, or you don't like Uncle Sam, uh, then you should seriously consider to move to another part of this planet. Uh, the American culture is our life, uh, uh, is a way of life, our heritage, and we are proud of it. Uh, we are happy with our culture. We have no desire to change. Uh, we really don't care how you did things where you came from. Uh, we are Americans, like it or not. This is our country, our land, and our lifestyle. Uh, our First Amendment gives us every uh, uh, right, uh, or gives every citizen the right to express his opinion about our government, our culture, our society, uh, and we will allow you every opportunity to do so. Well, but once you're done complaining, whining, and griping about our flag, our pledge, our national motto, our way of life, uh, I highly encourage you to take advantage of one, one other great American freedom, the right to leave. Hmm? I don't know who wrote that, but I'm for it. Thank God for America. We're Americans. Huh? Americans first. But we need to have some foresight. America's being eroded away. America's being stolen right before our eyes. Uh, listen, you know how much I travel. Uh, everywhere I go, people think like we think. I'm talking about even lost people. Uh, 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 we, we love America, and we're for America. Uh, uh, but the just minuscule, minute, uh, 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 have the loudest voice because uh, they own the media, they own the government. Uh, bless God, it's time. Uh, we gather some sticks and realize uh, uh, we need to take our country back uh, say how do you do it gather sticks and get on your knees and trust God uh, well, listen I'm talking about having some foresight this thing going on on Israel it's not going to be over in a couple of days I've heard that Iran is already back in Hamas duh that's where they came from and Iraq's talking about getting involved you know the capital of Iraq, don't you? Baghdad. You know what Baghdad was called in the Old Testament? Babylon. Let me give you some prophecy concerning Babylon in the end times. Isaiah 13, 19 says this, And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Listen now. It shall never be inhabited neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there neither shall the shepherds make their fold there Jeremiah 50 and 13 says because of the wrath of the Lord it shall not be inhabited uh, but it shall be wholly desolate uh, everyone that goeth by Babylon shall be astonished and hiss at all her plagues now listen we was in Afghanistan and Iraq for 20 years but they're still there. The Bible says there's coming a day when it won't even be inhabited. The only thing that's going to cause a place to become that desolate is a nuclear bomb. And can I say, Israel has as much nuclear capability as we do. And can I say, Israel isn't a bunch of pansies like America. Israel has fought for their rights for generations. I used to work uh, for a Jewish company, and they think everybody is against them. They don't care what you say. Time has proven Israel has to stand alone. She's God's chosen people, and everybody has always hated the Jews. They've always been under persecution. And I worked for that Jewish company. I, I, I walked into one of, the, one of the owner's office one day, and he had a beautiful calendar that had a picture of the temple in it. I said, oh, it's beautiful. And it was an Old Testament temple. I said, oh, that's beautiful. He said, you know this? I said, oh, yeah. And I explained to him, Solomon's temple, what all that represented in that picture. Well, a few days later, I'm sitting in my office. He comes, shuts the door, puts his feet on, his de on my desk, says, tell me everything you know. I said, well, that, that could take a while. I mean, I know, a lot, I know a little bit about sports. I know a little bit about this, a little bit about that, a little bit about, you know, a, little, a whole lot about eating. You know, what do you, what do you want me to tell? Well, what? Tell me everything you know and believe about the Bible. So I had a little Old Testament survey go on. 
told him everything about the history of the Jews. And then I showed him the mother-daughter relationship between the Jews and the church and how we wouldn't have a church if there wasn't a man who came through the Jewish lineage by the name of Jesus and how he was God's son, how the Messiah had already come. They're still looking for the Messiah to come. He already came. He's coming again, but they really aren't really looking for that one. So I explained it all to him. Three and a half hours. He was paying me. It was all said and done. He said, well, I can tell you this. You really believe what you know. I said, yes, sir, I do. I said, and make no mistake, I'm for the Jews and not because you're paying me. A few days later, that calendar was on my desk. He never, ever brought that topic up to me again. I hope somewhere along the line he got saved. We need to have some foresight. The only thing that's going to cause every nation to turn against Israel is if Israel lights off a nuke. Oh, they'll allow protests right now, but we're not bold enough to stand up and say, uh, no, we're against them. But they let off a nuke. Oh, the civil rights crowd will come out of the woodwork then. And I'm telling you, Babylon's going to be uninhabitable. All that sand's going to turn to glass. It's coming. Say, so, preacher, what are you saying? We need to gather sticks. It's time to gather sticks. Huh? Could be the beginning of the end. Hmm? Can I say gathering sticks takes fearlessness? You know the story in Acts 28 after Paul had made it to the island of Miletus and those that were on that ship in that terrible storm that was in Acts 27. And you know what was happening? They were over there. Those barbarous people treated them good and they was, you know, had a fire and was feeding them. And Paul was out gathering sticks for the fire. And you know what happened? When he put the sticks on the fire, the viper came out and bit him and he slung it off. Uh, Brother Mark Stroud preached the you know, if you get bit, don't quit. Amen. Can I say, when, he, when, when all that happened, they wanted to make Paul a god because he had no harm in him? Uh, can I say, if you gather sticks, you better be fearless. Yes. Not everybody likes you gathering sticks. Right. Amen. Not everybody wants to see you revived. Not everybody wants to see the Lord take over. Some people want to see us eat our last meal and die. You've got to be fearless. Can I say gathering sticks can be bothersome. He had to deal with the viper. And you gather sticks, I guarantee you the devil isn't going to like it. Amen. Gathering sticks can be burdensome. Gathering sticks is hard work and there's not much glory in it. Oh, we'll gather sticks if they're watching us and we're going to get some fame out of it. But when nobody's looking, that's when you really find the true soldiers. Mm, gathering sticks not only bothersome, burdensome, but it can be belittling. What are you doing gathering sticks? I thought your God was a great God. He is a great God. I'm gathering sticks. Amen. Amen. Can I say gathering sticks, though, will bring fulfillment? In Genesis 22, 7, Isaac spake to Abraham his father and said, My father... He said, here am I, my son. He said, behold the fire in the wood. But where's the lamb for the burnt offering? You know the story. God told Abraham to go off for Isaac. I believe, I believe he would have he offered him. I believe he'd have thrust him through with that knife. I believe he'd have burned him. And I believe that with all his heart, he believed that if he, if he burned him up and all his left was ashes, God was going to raise him up again because he believed the promises of God that God was going to make of Isaac a great nation. He had the knife lifted. But that great, great statement he made to answer Isaac on the way there came to fruition. He said, my son, God himself shall provide a lamb. And there was a ram caught in the thicket. Uh, but he had some sticks with him. See, gathering sticks brings fulfillment. It brings pardon. It brings peace. It brings purpose for your life. 
might be the very thing to get your prayers answered. You need to gather sticks. Hmm. Now, I'm about done. I preached a lot longer than I thought I would. But look again at verse number 12. The Bible says, And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, a little oil in a cruise. Behold, I'm gathering, how many? Two sticks. Notice that she didn't need many sticks. We don't need many sticks for God to move, just two. It is amazing. In the most simplistic form of the local church, he said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in the midst. Yeah. Don't need many sticks. Notice she didn't need mighty sticks. She wasn't gathering trees. Yeah. Moses had to throw a tree in the waters. She wasn't gathering trees. She just gathered sticks. A little frail widow woman couldn't gather a tree. She just did what she could. Yeah. She didn't need mighty sticks. Didn't need many sticks. Notice she didn't need miraculous sticks. Benny Hinn hadn't blessed them. Popoff hadn't used that little pack of special water on them. Uh, everywhere in the South you see that. You see them commercials with him. Says, Call this number and I'll send you this blessed water. A little bitty packet with two drops in it. This blessed water and it'll change your life. And they're showing all these people. Yeah, I got called and then I got a check in the mail for $57,000. Liar, liar, pants on fire. If you got $57,000, you'd fix them teeth. It wasn't miraculous sticks. That's our problem. We're looking for this miraculous event. Can I tell you, every time God did something tremendous, He came to ordinary people doing their ordinary thing. We just need to gather some sticks. Two sticks. You take two sticks, makes a cross. We need to keep our eyes on the cross. Hmm? And two sticks could represent Christ and you. And that makes you the majority. Amen. It's a blessing that Christ is in you, but it's also a greater blessing when Christ is with you. Amen. And two sticks could represent your choice to commit. I'm going to just gather sticks. That may be passing out a tract to somebody. That may be spending a little extra time praying, a little extra time seeking the Lord, a little more involved around the church house, giving a little bit more money to missions. I don't know what your two sticks are. I just know we need to gather some sticks. And so with that in mind, I brought some sticks today. All I know, somebody needs to have some faith. Somebody needs to have some fortitude. Somebody needs to have some, some purpose in their life to do something for God. Somebody just needs to gather some sticks. That's all I know. I, I, don't, I don't know much, but I know that widow woman was going to die. But she gathered some sticks. She didn't die, she lived. Hmm. Uh, can I say that meal barrel didn't go out for many days, it said. Everything might look bleak in your household. Don't have to be. Just gather some sticks. This stick might represent your commitment to be more faithful. Might represent you're just going to trust God. Might represent somebody in your life you want to see get right with God. I don't know. All I know is I'm throwing out some sticks. That's all I know. All I know is they're not doing any good sitting there on the, on the carpet. Somebody needs to come gather some sticks. Somebody needs to commit to what God wants for their life. Somebody just needs to commit to give more of themselves to God. I don't know. Somebody might need to get saved. Why don't you come? Instead of a stick, we'll get you the Savior. I don't know. All I know is there's some sticks out there. And the Lord said need to gather some sticks. Just why don't you gather some sticks this morning? Might be what changes our country. Might be what strengthens Israel. Might be what 
helps people on the foreign fields get born again. Might be what takes in revival. I don't know. I just know we need to gather some sticks. So there they are. Just gather some sticks. Folks are gathered. I'm going to pray. Father, we love you. Lord, we see glimpses of what's going on in this world. God, you see it all. And sometimes we only see a little bit of meal and a little cruise of oil. We think that's it. But God, you know how to fill the meal barrel and how to bless the cruise of oil. God, you know what is needed in our lives, in our community, in our country. God, I pray you'd help us just keep gathering sticks. Keep trusting the Lord. Keep doing the Lord's work. Keep putting you first. Keep seeking your face. God, the next great event for Christianity might be just somebody here gathering some sticks. Lord, the great Welsh revival started with just a couple young people having a burden to pray. God, there's no telling what you'll do if two or three are gathered in your name. God, just help folks. Lord, there's folks here in pain. There's folks here who's hurting for loved ones. There's folks here wondering if you'll still answer prayer. Lord, the situation looks dire and impossible. Lord, help them just keep gathering sticks, and then, God, you do for them what they can't do for themselves. Show folks the impossible is possible in Christ. God, do great things and glorious things for your name's sake that we might praise the Lord for all of his goodness towards us. Oh, that men would praise the Lord. God, I pray you'd help folks now. In Jesus' name, amen.